um, give a quick kind of update on what's going on in the Amazon because the Amazon was in the news this past summer, mostly, and through fall. And um, after that, talk about how Brazil nut fits within that. This is a species I've been studying for most of my career, and so I thought I would present about it today. Um, I have, you can tell that that's me on this side, but we have a group of people, of course, that have been working on this for a long time. Um, this is my main collaborator, Luz Tabassi from Indiapa, and we've been working together for over a decade, and she's been instrumental in this work. Christy Stadhammer, who many of you know, was a faculty member here and is now at the University of Alabama. And on the SFRC side, Wendell Cropper figures prominently because he's been working with us on some modeling efforts with students. These are various students over time that have worked on this. And these are some students, and I didn't put Thiago um, Sosa. Thiago Sosa also from the Federal University of Acre that have participated in this research. And um, so let me just kind of start off by talking a little bit about the Amazonian context. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what rubber tappers are and their social movement, and then talk about some of the recent trends, like I said, this summer. So rubber tappers are, if you can think of them as traditional peoples, they're not um, ethnically distinct. They're traditional peoples that were recruited to work in the Amazon from the very dry northeastern portion of Brazil. So I say they were recruited because they were recruited in two rubber booms, one that occurred because of the Industrial Revolution when they needed um, things like uh, rubber, um, all kinds of rubber belts and tires, et cetera, during the Industrial Revolution. And then the second um, rubber boom was after, um, during World War II, because there, were plant there was plantation rubber in um, Asia, but the Axis powers controlled that plantation rubber. So there was a second rubber boom during World War II, and actually rubber tappers to this day are very proud that they were considered rubber soldiers during World War II. Um, you know, so I'm going to present to everybody else. They're not, okay. They're not doing it. They're not getting it. So when they were recruited, the other thing I would like to say is they were under very difficult, harsh working conditions. It, they were actually considered to be under debt servitude for the most part. Um, so they were um, working under these uh, harsher conditions. But that relaxed between those two rubber booms and then after World War II, those conditions relaxed. And so um, they were able to work with other products besides rubber because initially they really had to focus on rubber production. That's what they were recruited to do. And let's see if I can show you some of the other kinds of products that they participated in and continue to use. Yeah. So I, the other thing I guess I should point out is that we were recruited to tap natural rubber. So this kind of represents some of the rubber trails. They were just um, very sparsely, uh, sparse densities of rubber trees in the Brazilian Amazon. So they would actually walk through these trails and collect rubber from each individual tree. Um, but over the over the generations, should I put these lights down? Is that better? Um, so over the generations, when, when they had a relaxed system, they were able to conduct agriculture, they did game hunting, um, a whole slew of different activities in their, in their life, in their homes, including Brazil nut fruits, um, Brazil nut collection. So I'll talk about that obviously more in a minute. This scenario changed a lot in the 1970s. Um, the military government came to power um, the rubber plantations in Asia were producing lots of rubber, and so the subsidies that the Brazilian government gave for rubber um, were extinguished. Um, and during the military government, what they wanted to do with the Amazon is they, they, saw, they saw all this empty land, and they said, we can use it as a safety valve, in essence, because there were a lot of people in Brazil that wanted land that lived down south. They opened up the Amazon, and they considered it a land for people, for people without land. Of course, there were people occupying that land, but that was um, a secondary concern. And so investors, land grabbers, investors in land, ranchers, small and large farmers came up from the South to occupy the Amazon. And as you can imagine, the rubber tappers are in the forest saying, what's going on? This is our land. We've lived here for generations. And um, so there was a lot of conflict and violent conflict. 
and the rubber tappers mobilized. What they did is they formed a workers' union um, and various workers' unions. It was supported in part by the Catholic Church under the auspices of liberation theology, if ever any of you have heard about that. Um, and the national and international environmental groups also supported the rubber tappers. While the rubber tappers were fighting for their livelihood and fighting for their lifestyles, the, uh, they also recognized, hey, this is, this is um, a, a topic that rings for true in terms of tropical conservation. So that's why the international environmental groups were quite interested. So, so when the tappers mobilized, there was also um, violence. Many tappers and many tapper leaders were killed, including um, Chico Menges, who is probably one of the most, is probably the most famous rubber tapper. And you can see that he had a, he was very savvy, um, very charismatic, and he had a real vision for the Amazon. And this is a, uh, one of his quotes. He was assassinated 31 years ago on December the 22nd. And when he was assassinated, it really grabbed um, international attention as this is just one headline from the New York Times. It was all over global news. And it, it grabbed global news, not only because he was someone who was defending the forest. Another thing that grabbed global news was the fact that they've had this proposal for extractive reserves. And extractive reserves would be they're kind of akin to indigenous reserves. It's government owned land, and it would be designated for sustainable extraction conservation of renewable natural resources. So it's in essence what they've been doing for generations by these resident populations who have a history of non-timber extraction. And this was considered an incredible victory and sustainable use of these forests kind of became codified. It was no longer just parks. We can, perhaps we can sustainably use these, this Amazon and other locations around the globe. So some of the repercussions of this was, it was so widespread that IUCN, the World Conservation Union, they actually had a designated a new type of protected area, a protected area with sustainable use of natural resources. And what it did locally, where the rubber tappers were located or regionally, was it really redirected attention from, oh, we have to fight for our land rights to, wait, we need to also have economic security. Remember, the rubber subsidies had been foregone. And it really encouraged a transition from just sort of general exploitation of the forest to, we should be managing this resource. This is something that's quite important. And, um, in the Amazon, this is the legal Brazilian Amazon. This is the mouth of the Amazon here out of Belém. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And what it did in, in for Amazonian conservation was really significant. Um, nowadays, in terms of strict reserves, this kind of, um, this color green and sustainable use protected areas, the lighter green, you can see they're dotted all across the Amazon. They compose. They consist of 21% of the Amazon are in these sustainable use reserves or these strict reserves. And if you add indigenous lands, it's another 25% of the Brazilian Amazon. So local people, whether they're traditional peoples or indigenous peoples, there are a lot of lands now designated for sustainable use, which is amazing given that this occurred, began to occur in the early um, 1990s. That was when it first started. So how did that relate to deforestation? Um, Chico Mendes was assassinated in 1988 at the very left-hand side of our um, deforestation um, graph. And you can see that deforestation goes up and down over the years. In the mid 2000s, it really started to decline. And the question I wanna respond to is kind of why? Why did it start declining? There are all kinds of reasons. Um, um, let me go back. Why did it start to decline? So there were different reasons. One, as I mentioned, they now have sustainable use reserves and indigenous lands. And theoretically, those are not to be deforested at any sort of high rate. Um, in general, this idea of regularization of lands 
making lands registered is a really critical component that occurred during that period, such that people, it was very clear if this land was yours or if this land was mine, because before that, it really wasn't. And there still exists a, quite a bit of the Amazon that has not gone through the tenure process. It's just a massive amount of land. Another thing that happened was they now have surveillance in real time in the Brazilian Amazon, and they have enforcement. So people can see what's going on and they can take measures. And for a long time, they took pretty strict measures. Another thing that happened is agriculture. They have a lot of sustainable agriculture measures, including the recension of credit. If you don't, if you aren't registered, if you're not, if you're not, if you're deforesting, deforesting improperly and you're not registered, you will not be able to get credit to improve your ranch or improve your agriculture. Um, and there was also a lot of pressure from Brazilian society and international groups. So deforestation starts going down. And here you can see it kind of, it's still kind of just a little bit down, but starting to sneak up. And let's look at this last year's 2018. And this past year in 2019, these are the kinds of headlines we saw, right? It was a global splash um, that fires in the Amazon were occurring. And one of the reasons that there has been this uptick is there's been a change in politics and policies in the Brazilian Amazon. There's a new government, in other words, a new government that's in power. Um, and these fires that surged, that grabbed our attention, the, the, one of the reasons there was alarm for that uptick is because it's not a particular, it wasn't a particularly dry year. Typically, when you get an uptick, it's, it's part of it is often because it's a really dry year. It's not a dry year, so people felt alarmed. The other reason is because there's a change in government, so people are watching, you know, what's going to happen with this new government. Um, and so these are some of the fires. These are hot spots. This is from 2000 to 2019. And you can see that there's quite a few hot spots. We've had a lot of hot spots in the past but those are typically in really dry years. So that was one of the reasons that people were so perplexed. And I wanna show what are the reasons behind these hotspots, because like I said, they have terrific surveillance in Brazil. They have a terrific um, system for, surveil sur for surveilling. And this is information from Ani Alencar, who's an SFRC alumnus. Yay! And she's director of science at IPAM. And I wanna thank um, Juliana Santiago told me about this data. Um, so if you look at this data, what were those hots? What are the fires from? Where are they located? They're located largely on small and large rural um, farms and ranches, and they're located on lands that haven't yet been regularized, that either that's completely undesignated forest, meaning it's a forest that hasn't been um, codified into a national forest or whatever it might be, and unregistered land, lands that haven't been registered at all. So what's happened is land grabbing, deforestation, or hotspots on this area, and the hotspots are very clearly linked to deforestation. <coughs> this other would be hotspots have increased basically everywhere, and that includes indigenous reserves and sustainable use reserves. But like always, those types of lands do not have a large rates of deforestation. They really do serve to stem deforestation. So that is what has been happening this past year. Um, and I guess I would add to me another thing that is really critical is that violence on indigenous lands has also increased in these areas because it's basically the message has been received that indigenous people and indigenous lands aren't really legitimate actors. That's kind of the message that the federal government has been giving out in recent um, months. So this is kind of the setting of the Amazon in a nutshell right now in terms of deforestation and hotspots. And what I'd like to do now is kind of show how Brazil nut fits within that particular scenario. So um, let's take a look at this incredible species. To me, it's incredible. And I hope you had some cookies that my um, daughter made. And I apologize that I don't have um, angiosperm cookie cutters. I just have those conifer cookie cutters. So that's what we use, but they're good. Um, so this is an enormous, it can get to be huge. It's an enormous um, tree within the Amazon region. And um, 
can be reach up to 50 meters in height, three meters in diameter. diameter. It's enormous. Um, berry can be very long lived. Um, some dating puts it well up to a thousand years old, um, but it's very common to live for hundreds of years. <coughs> um, there's this great paper that came out and talked about what species dominate within the Amazon. And within terra firme, which means the uplands, right, that are continue to be dry, within in the upland forest, it's one of the top 20 most dominant tree species because of its size. And, um, and it's up to 1.3% of the total above ground biomass within the terra firme. So this species is not only important for um, uh, ecological purposes, I want to also show you how it's important for um, commercial purposes. One thing about the species, it takes decades to reach reproductive maturity. This is some work from Todd Burtwell, guided by River Copper, um, and some of the modeling he did. And these are two sites that we have worked, and he estimated that it took, in one site, up to 83 years to reach reproductive maturity and another site almost double that. So this is a long process. Um, but in full sun, this is a tree that we planted together um, many years ago. And at 20 years, at 47 centimeters, it produced this fruit. There are definitely over time trade-offs between fruit production and growth. Let me just kind of walk you through this a little bit. So we've divided into centimeter, uh, 50 centimeter size classes, um, kind of as a, um, a substitute, if you will, for age. So within zero to 50 centimeters, it's really just a slow slog to the top. These seedlings are trying to find light. They find light, they, they grow a little bit, it takes forever, like that 60, 87 to 100 and whatever years, right? Um, at 50 to 100 centimeters, height growth continues, and I can show you up at the top, one of the things I want to point out here, where you're getting growth and the rise to the top, you can see the canopy, um, canopy classes up there. They're suppressed and intermediate at the low level, and then slowly but surely, they find um, co-dominance and dominance. By the time they get to 50 to 100, the majority of them are in the co-dominant to dominant stage, those huge trees that get so high. And um, all trees, most of uh, all trees really virtually are reproductive with clear trade-offs with best basal area growth. If, they're re if they give a lot, if they are producing a lot of fruits, they're not growing as fast. There's no doubt about that. Um, and then when you get to this segment between 100 and 150, that's when fruit production is really the best. Um, and there is, we could not discern any trade-offs between at least basal area increment and production. And environmental variables will, was what was driving both growth and reproduction. And then once you get past 150 centimeters, production tends to fall in most of those trees and obviously growth slows to senescence to where the trees eventually are, are dying. So I just wanted to show some of the dynamics of this species. It's really fun to study. Um, the flowers on Brazil nut are perfect. That means that they have the male and female parts on the same flower, right? The flowers are fairly small. They're about like this, but they're, that's large enough. And they have kind of a hooded, they have a hooded piece over the stigma. And so the bees have to be able to get inside that hood. They have to be quite strong. So they're euglossine bees. They're solitary bees that are fairly large um, that pollinate um, Brazil nuts. Um, and the tree itself, those flowers are self-incompatible. Even flowers within the same tree are largely incompatible to prevent inbreeding. One of the curious things is that these euglossine bees, these very large bees that are large enough to open that hood and they also have a tongue that can slip it in, um, they require fragrance count compounds from orchids that live in the forest. So it's kind of this one of those terrific uh, symbiotic relationships that we like to talk about in the tropics that are so complicated and evolutionarily designed. Um, the fruit, as you can see, it's really hard and woody. Um, and it holds something like, you know, somewhere between 20, around 20 seeds in here. They fall to the forest floor like this from that very tall tree, and they require intervention of some animal to be released. 
And the main disperser is this large rodent um, called the agouti desiccata. And that's almost always how they uh, gnaw open this fruit. They're cute little boogers. Of course, these are seeds. The nuts are seeds, and I've got one over here too. These nuts are the seeds that you're eating. And so they have enjoyed a long standing market on the international market. For decades and generations, they, everything was exported. Almost everything was exported. People did consume them locally, but not even beyond the Amazon region. You would be hard pressed um, several decades back to find Brazil nuts in Rio de Janeiro, for example. People didn't even know what they were oftentimes. So since 1633, that was when the first exports went to Europe. Um, and why were they able to do this so long ago when there was no technology? Well, it's really, there's a couple of reasons. One, the Brazil nut collection period is complementary to rubber. Brazil nuts fall in the rainy season, you collect rubber in the dry season. <laughs> Another reason is these nuts and the fruits are really slow to perish, so they can lay on the forest floor for a period of time without going bad. And that means also that you can squish them all together and you can transport them by um, mule or by truck. So it's one of the reasons that it's had this long standing market success. And it's been incredibly important to Amazonian extractive economies. I just put some figures up there, everything from the value chain from people who collect all the way through the processors, et cetera. Um, and that's some of the export value that's not captured, it's official statistics. So all the value isn't captured there. Um, nowadays, some of the recent research that's been done by Amy Duchel and Marlene Soriano, both also UF alums, SFRC alums, um, up to 44% of total household income in some of their surveys in Bolivia were from Brazil nuts. That one little period in January, February, March, when they're collecting Brazil nuts, 44% of total income. So you can see how resource dependent they are on that. About three quarters, another interesting statistics for me is about three quarters of the 2016 harvest in Brazil are traded domestically. So Brazil used to really dominate the commercial market for centuries, decades. Um, but in around the 19, um, late 1990s, early 2000s, it shifted from a monopoly in Belen at the mouth of the river, of the, uh, the mouth of the Amazon River in um, Brazil to Bolivia. And that's for various reasons, but that was a big shift. So much so that nowadays Bolivians and Peruvians who are the other commercial producers, they wanna call it Amazon net. So don't be fooled, it's all the same thing. Um, another <coughs> key point in terms of this is prices have risen dramatically over the last few decades. So it's really worth it for people to go out and collect these fruits from the forest and sell them. And they are collected almost solely from these intact, mature old growth forests. Um, by traditional peoples and indigenous peoples who live near and inside of these forests. I put indigenous peoples too, that's an increasing, another increasing trend is indigenous people are starting to get in on the commercial market. Before they would just collect for subsistence use, but now increasingly it's also for commercial purposes. Um, and those symbiotic relationships that I talked about between bees and trees and flowers um, and agouti as well may help explain why Brazil nut plantations have not proven successful. You know, but maybe small scale plantations like those, you can see this is a, a farmer we visited with. You can see his forest in the background and it's very possible that those plantations that he has, maybe they'll be viable because the forest is nearby. But certainly um, large scale plantations in the midst of pasture haven't proved fruitful. So in sum, you know, the species supports Amazonian families and it's also a key significant factor in Amazonian conservation because it has economic value and because it's such a large species. So let me talk a little bit about patterns of fruit production, kind of what we have discerned in some of our research and what others have discerned. At 
based on the landscape scales, as you can imagine, it's commercially viable. So we know that we have fairly consistent production over years. There's no doubt about it. It's one of the reasons it is commercially viable. At the population level, it's fairly constant. This is a one population that we've been studying since 2002. This is average fruits per tree, and it goes up and down a little bit. Um, but it's, there is, um, it's fairly constant, but there is also significant variation between populations, just like you could imagine. Some, in some areas, they produce far better than in other areas. At the tree level, there's dramatic variation from one year to the next. Um, in any given year, one, one of the things we have found is that 27% of the trees produced about 75% of the nuts. And that can shift from one year to the next, which trees those are. Um, in terms of patterns of fruit production, as, you know, as we mentioned, DBH, diameter breast height, is one of the things that um, determines how much fruit production we have. This is an earlier paper in which we were looking and identifying that, yeah, it's that 100 to 150 centimeter um, size class that really are the best producers. <laughs> Site quality, as you as all you foresters know, is a big issue um, in terms of production. Crown position and size, they're virtually all those big trees are dominant or co-dominant, um, but also the size of the crown has a very strong relationship with how many fruits can be produced. And, and the crown size is also linked to, uh, correlated with diameter at breast height. And liana load, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That makes a difference as well. So a question that has arisen many times is, well, you know, they're collecting these very seeds that are going to produce the next recruits. Are they harvesting too much such that it's not sustain sustainable? Um, there's some problems that we encounter with that is Brazil nut seedlings are naturally at very low densities. They just aren't out there that much. They're not proliferating out in the forest naturally. That's one thing. And they're kind of hard to identify. They look like a lot of other species that are out there. Um, uh, the other thing that we people are considering, well, the fauna, the agouti also depends on Brazil nut for its own survival. So these are some of the questions that have come up. And we've tried to address this, and I'll show you that others have as well. Um, we came up with a paper in 2008 that we looked at three different sites um, and tried to determine what is the population structure within that, and particularly looking at young seedlings. And what we found in our minds was we found sufficient seedlings. And when you compare that to a paper that was looking at um, whether you can consider them the harvest to be sustainable or not, this site looked like it to, and according to this paper would be considered unharvested. But they didn't notice that there was any difference in seedling numbers or numbers between 10 and 60 centimeters. So those juvenile trees in Filipinas and Pudem on Yandaba, when you compare it to our Cachuela site, it would, look like it would be considered lightly harvested. So that's some bit of evidence for us that tells us that they're harvesting at intensities that are probably okay. Since that period, there's been other papers that have come out. This is the one I mentioned that we're looking at. And this one with Burtwell that, that um, Wendell helped participate on and really guided um, Todd Burtwell did a matrix model, which I'll show. And these others that have also been um, conducted. It's also a little uh, consistent with local ecological knowledge. So Western science and local ecological knowledge is basically telling us that maybe we're okay. And let me explain a little bit more why we think that. But I'm also gonna point out that Parazol suggested demographic collapse in some places, which, which is still out there. Um, the paper that Todd Burtwell did on the right, he was a SFRC master student. He, um, Wendell helped guide him through a matrix population modeling scenario. And the model supported the hypothesis that under current rates, those populations are stable under the current rates of harvest. The thing, another thing that was pointed out in the paper is that this population, these trees live for centuries. So the population only changes gradually. If you have um, a, a dearth in seedlings one year, it's probably okay, because you've got another 40 to 400 years that can make that up. As Wendell always likes to say, if you have one Brazil nut tree that dies, you need to have only one that replaces it. 
Um, so what we'd like to highlight is rather than all this worry on seed fate and limiting harvest and having harvest restrictions, we would like to point out that the survival of existing adults, either through deforestation or through electrical lines that are going out into the forest and they cut down um, trees that are just about reproductively mature, that's a bigger issue in our minds. We also um, did a study, this was led by a Brazilian um, graduate student in which we tracked um, the fruits as they were falling from the forest um, between November through um, <clears throat> December, we stopped it mid-January. And what we saw from that is these, these students tracked these fruits as they fell from the forest and determined what happened to them. Did an agouti take them? Did an agouti open them? Did they remain in place? Were they just taken and we couldn't find them anymore because we only looked outside the, the um, parallels of the forest canopy. <laughs> and so this is typically when the producer would go in and collect, the harvester would go in the 15th of January. That's kind of his mental model. And by the time he would go in, what we saw is that there were 94% of the fruits had already fallen from the trees at that mid-January. And um, what happened with the agouti at that point was 4.1% of the fruits were moved outside of the crown, meaning that just like a squirrel, what they do is they gnaw it open and then they'll hide, the, eat some of the seeds and hide the rest. Sometimes they'll even hide the whole fruits. And of course, just like squirrels, they forget them sometimes. And so that really helps facilitate germination. And um, by that point, agouti had opened another uh, half a percent underneath the um, tree itself of the fruits. So what we say, our conclusions are that he had weeks of unlimited seed access. And what we know is he consumed or dispersed 197 fruits, or if you start calculating it out, it's about 3,000 over 3,000 seeds. So just trying to think of whether that, how that plays out. Another thing we've looked at is these lianas, which are woody vines. And of course, they're all over in tropical regions. And we see them here in Gainesville too, right? Um, but if you consider that these trees are hundreds of years old, you can imagine how many vines, how many lianas can climb up those trees over a long period. And of course, if these trees are so tall, the lianas have great advantage to be at the very top of the tallest trees. And so what we did is we took a, a, took a series of trees, we had 140 trees, and we looked at what is the percent of the crown that's covered by lianas. And we had four categories where there were no, no lianas on the tree, less than 25% of the crown was covered between 25 and 75 and greater than 75. And as you can see from the letters, we found that yes, if you have over 25% of the liana coverage, then you're going to have less fruit production. That was a clear finding. Um, and so we did a liana cutting experiment where we um, treated the trees or cut them. And we cut them in 2002 and there was no difference. It takes about 14 to 15 months for the fruits to mature. So we knew that first year we weren't gonna get any differences because the fruits were already set for that particular layer. 2003, no difference between those where the <coughs> lianas were cut or not cut. 2004, still no difference. We're starting to get a little nervous. 2005, no difference. <laughs> we're wondering if we're spinning our wheels. Um, and then in 2006, um, for the first time, those that had the vines cut began to produce more than if they didn't. And you can kind of see how that plays out over time. One of the things we also figured out from this study is in high, to point out in high rainfall years, like these blue years with high rainfall, you've got dramatically greater production differences between vines cut and vines not cut. And rainfall, of course, is one of the um, driving factors behind fruit production. And in drought years, you didn't get as big a difference. And this is kind of important because in our region of the Amazon and a lot of the Amazon, it's drying. So we know that climate change is going to be a factor in the future, if not already. What are some of the mechanisms behind this increase in fecundity when you do the liana cutting treatment? Um, one of the things we know is that there were a lot more lianas within five meters of the tree. 
So we had not only that kind of under below ground competition from the lianas is one thing we think, but we also know that um, those lianas also go up into the canopy that we have above ground competition. So these, these lianas at within five meters of the tree accounted for 70% of all the lianas that were above the crown. Some of the lianas were over 20 meters away from the tree. They would just climb up through other trees and get onto the Brazil nuts. Um, but so this is some of the findings that we had within this, what I thought was a really cool study. Um, another thing that we observed over time was it took about a year for all those lianas to fall from the tree. So they'd be still up there. These are woody vines. It took about a year for them to disintegrate and fall to the ground. And then once these heavily infested trees were liana free, the branches started reforming. So you'd see these little stick-like branches and then slowly but surely they would grow over time. Um, so the population level benefits of liana cutting is another thing we observed. It appeared to maybe thwart mortality in some trees. As you can imagine, those trees that are heavily infested, they can't support all those lianas for the weight and also, of course, because they're covering up all their foliage. Um, it also, we've noticed that it may induce non-producing trees to become producers. So that may be one of the reasons we see some zero production. And Finally, the other thing I would add is it's really easy to cut lianas on these trees. You can do it when you're harvesting the fruits. So you go once a year to harvest the fruits, you're at the tree. It takes just a few minutes to cut down the lianas. They'll re-sprout, but you can cut them again the next year. Another um, pathway to increase production is searching and mapping. Um, so this was a study again by an UFAC, a federal university student. And he worked with a, a harvester and, and he discerned where are the trails that his Brazil nut trails that he's going through the forest to collect from these trees. And he observed when he actually mapped it out that the harvester was only collecting from 70% of the trees because trees are constantly coming into fruit production over you know, years and sometimes they don't really notice that well. Um, and he figured that if he added to his routine collection route, productivity could be increased by 27%. So lianas can increase, if you cut lianas, it can increase it up to threefold. That's what we saw in 10 years. And if you do some mindful mapping or searching, you could, you could increase again. Oh, and I also wanted to, for those of you who are in another realm of thinking, um, another thing the extractivists use this map for to get a, a bank loan because it proved that he had a productive system within Brazil nuts. Usually you have to have show that you have cattle or you have agriculture, he showed that he had Brazil nuts. Um, Brazil nut also regenerates, this is Jamie Cota, another SFRC alum, and she looked at fallow fields, those fields that have um, gone fallow after agriculture. They, have, they practice shifting agriculture, or itinerant agriculture in this region. And those fields that are going fallow, she observed that seedlings, Brazil nut seedlings and saplings were in higher numbers when compared to mature forest. This is something that producers had told us in the past and we wanted to quantify it. And I would add that the producers also, some of them also, some of the harvesters also told us that if you cut vines, if you cut lianas, it'll produce more. And so we're, some of the things we're doing is basically taking traditional ecological knowledge and putting some science behind that or in complement to it. So this was some work that Jamie did. And then just recently, Eduardo, who many of you know, um, uh, did hit with his master's work, took that information, did a few more inventories in fallow fields and projected out how much those trees could produce from those fallow areas. And here too, it was a harvester, a local harvester who said, I'm gonna leave all my fallow fields to just grow up into mature forest because I'm gonna increase my Brazil nut production by I think he said 25% without doing anything. And so that's kind of where this, this study came in. Hopefully it's in review right now. So if you're one of the reviewers, give us a good one. <laughs> um, just finally, this, this is an old study, but this is looking at where could you enrich um, the, the land holdings that these extractivists have, these sustainable use people, where could you enrich? 
and we looked at forest gaps, which are where Brazil nut regenerates naturally, pasture and shifting cultivation plots. And this kind of also gets at the why those shifting cultivation plots or those fallows are doing quite well. And that's because when you look at resources, light, water, and nutrients, they're highly available in these shifting cultivation plots and in these fallows because they, they burn the fields for one. So you release all of those nutrients, you get rid of weeds and pests, et cetera. Um, if you plant within shifting cultivation plots, in those cases before, they just regenerated naturally because I forgot to add that the agouti loves those tangled messes that are in those fallow fields. They absolutely love that. So they come, they hide, they plant, et cetera. And also, as you can imagine, those fallows and the shifting cultivation plots, you have higher light situations. So this is probably the best place for sure to, if you do any enrichment. So just to conclude, you know, um, scientific evidence and local knowledge indicates that current levels of nut harvests are probably sustainable. And even if there is any small question to that, we advocate that people should harvest because that is one of, this is a key resource. The tree itself um, lives for generations and um, centuries. So it's a reasonable assumption in our opinion. And rather than concentrating so much on seed fate and having um, restrictions on harvest, we think we should really concentrate on keeping those big trees standing. Um, and that Brazil nut productivity can be increased by certainly by cutting lianas, mindful searching, and tending recruits that either regenerate naturally or even you can do enrichment plantings. Of course, enrichment plantings are a lot more expensive than just letting things grow. And um, so that's about it. And I always want to give a little spiel to disseminate findings in many, many ways besides the scientific publications. So that's what this slide's about and this one as well. We often go out, this is with um, an indigenous group that is now Purina that are now also harvesting Brazil nuts. And it would, they have, uh, there was an environmental agent training. We were able to give our little Brazil nut talk, which we, it's basically the same thing I just gave, except with poster form. And um, so we do that sort of thing. So um, thank you all very much. That's all I have to say. <laughs>